everyone, welcome to Elvis Presley Past, Present and Future, where we are continuing on with our Elvis journey. Elvis has joined the army, so let's continue and find out what happens to him while he's in the US Army. Elvis woke up in the large barracks with five dozen other men at Fort Hood. The millionaire entertainer, suddenly earning $78 a month, was desperate to be accepted as one of the guys. Dorton Matthews, a sergeant in the barracks, remembers how every arriving recruit had received $20 in cash to get another haircut and buy toothpaste and other necessities. One of the sergeants told Elvis, Presley, give me that $20. You don't need it. Elvis said, Sergeant, I'm broke. Elvis was also desperate not to be given any favours. His comrades were sceptical. Rex Manfield, who had started out with Elvis on the Memphis bus, remembers the comments being thrown Elvis's way. Where's your hound dog? And aren't you all lonesome for your teddy bear? But as soon as they saw he was just another recruit, he became one of the guys. I thought he was going to get special treatment, remembers another private, Simon Vega. But he did KP, guard duty, everything just like us. He did every little thing we did. The teasing had stopped by the end of basic training. Rex Mansfield recalls, Elvis really tried to be one of the boys. He participated in every training class. Every field trip, and he marched alongside of us for hours. Most of us usually watched him from the corner of our eyes. We were very sceptical and expected Elvis to ask for and receive extra attention and favours. But, can honestly say, that from the very start, he never asked for any special treatment at all. He went through the basic training, just like the rest of us. Actually, he was under scrutiny from prying eyes. The pressure on him must have been enormous. But he never complained. The rest of us were constantly whining about everything, which is quite normal for a bunch of GIs. Elvis seemed to love every minute of it. Maybe it was because he had been in that other world for such a long time. Now this was a chance for him to be just one of the guys. Eddie Faldell remembers. My relationship with Elvis began in February 1956. I was a disc jockey at KRLD in Dallas and Elvis was making the rounds. Texas was one of his stomping grounds in those days. He had a lot of success in Texas and I met him at the radio station where he was promoting some of his records. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. The friendship deepened when Elvis was stationed at Fort Hood in nearby Colleen. It was a time when the singer was certain that the army would end his entertainment career and was grateful for a home away from home. While Elvis was stationed at Fort Hood in Colleen and wanted to lose himself, he would visit the Faldell home in Waco every weekend, often with his girlfriend Anita and his parents. The Faldells honoured his request that he would have complete privacy from their own friends and family and even built onto their house to make a special room for Elvis, decorated it to Elvis's fancy with pink and black cabinets, plush black and white carpet, a hi-fi, a glass cigar box filled with the Havana Tampa cigarillos Elvis loved to chew on, and a couch in similar fashion to his own at Graceland. And each week's new record releases were awaiting him when he arrived from week to week. It was a place Elvis and Anita could relax in private. Notice the bandage on Elvis's little finger? Private Stephen Kitzman recalls, We were out on the infiltration range. That's when we crawl on the ground and they were firing over our heads. We were at the end of it where you'd get up and cross this ditch. They had logs across this ditch 
and Elvis went across it, fell off the log, into the ditch, and cut his little finger on his bayonet. Afterwards, he laughed, saying, you guys gonna have to march back. They're giving me a ride back to the infirmary to get my finger fixed. Janice Faldell, Eddie Faldell's daughter, recalls, I can still remember how exciting it was to have Elvis as a guest in our home. His arrivals were always dramatic. One Sunday afternoon, as I sat, I sat at a table in the back of the house, colouring and gazing out the window, I saw a black Cadillac, followed by a bunch of limos, all pull up to the side of our house, followed by another, then another, until a stream of Cadillacs lined the street in front of our house. Elvis is here. I ran screaming to my mum. Elvis is here. I was screaming all through the house. My mother was frantic. Suddenly a house full of hungry guests was thrust upon her. My dad was thrilled to see his friend again. Elvis's visits always sent ripples not through our household but the city as well. Although I was only five years old, I knew Elvis was someone special by the way all the grown-ups acted when they were around him. With the death of his mother, Elvis went into a state of profound shock from which he would never fully emerge. Although reports of him spending weeks weeping alone in his darkened bedroom are largely false. In fact, the subdued and deeply distressed Private Presley was back on duty at Fort Hood about a week after the funeral. Not even the comforting normality of the military routine, however, could disguise the fact that his gaze, which was once deeply direct, was now focused inwards. Eddie Fidel accompanied Elvis to Memphis and remained at the Graceland Mansion for the, for the entire time that Elvis was on leave from Fort Hood. They returned to Waco together and Elvis went on to Fort Hood to continue his army training. A beautiful live oak tree was planted on the front terrace of the Faldell home in perpetual memory to the late Gladys Love Presley. Elvis telephoned his deep appreciation. Elvis told a close circle of friends on many occasions, I could count on one hand the true friends I have who don't need me or use me for anything. And I'm proud to say Eddie is one of them. Those words were ingrained in Eddie's memory. And Eddie said, they shall remain there as long as I live. To Eddie, Elvis Presley was nothing if not lonely and sensitive. A grieving Elvis went back to work at Fort Hood on August 25. His dad Vernon, grandmother Minnie, cousins Jean and Junior Smith, as well as right-hand man Lamar Fike, were there to keep him company. Colonel Parker and Anita Wood visited, Grandma Minnie Mae cooked, and the bunch spent the nights playing and singing gospel songs until late. The whole country mourned. Cards and letters poured into Parker's headquarters. The men at Fort Hood did too. Things were never quite the same. Again. We all suffered. They became, the men all became more protective of their friend. After his mother died, we saw to it that nobody interfered with his privacy. He got a lot more serious. I doubt he was ever as happy after she died. I don't think he ever got over it. During his first week, during his last week, sorry, at Fort Hood, Elvis was promoted to private first class. That week, the crowds outside the Oak Hill Drive home were the largest of his stay. Some nights, a hundred people kept vigil. On his last night, reported the Colleen Daily Herald, a very nice orderly group lined the yard and left the driveway clear so Elvis could leave for a dinner date. Only a scream or two from teenage girls disrupted the orderly way in which the crowd greeted Elvis. Sad faces were seen 
when the family and friends gathered at Eddie Fodell's house to say goodbye to Elvis one last time. Eight weeks of basic training, followed by eight more weeks of advanced training with a two-week leave in between, is now over. Now, on his way to Brooklyn, where the USS Randall is waiting to take the soldiers far away from their home country to Europe. A land that most of these boys, Elvis among them, would indeed be foreign. It was just one month ago that his mother had passed away. The Brooklyn bound troop train from Fort Hood stopped in Memphis for a crew change. This gave Elvis the opportunity to say goodbye to some of his Memphis friends along the way. The train stood in the Memphis Southern Railway Yard, just south of Liberty Land and the fairgrounds. Now I wonder if anybody can guess who was sitting next to Elvis in this photo. Let me tell you. Charlie Hodge and Elvis first met at Fort Hood, but being in different companies, they did not get acquainted. Charlie found Elvis and sat with him on the train ride. Charlie Hodge's background in music and entertainment, plus his comedic personality, quickly endeared Elvis to Charlie. His sense of humour kept Elvis laughing rather than dwelling on the recent loss of his mother. Thus, the two became fast friends, a friendship that lasted for the rest of their lives. The troop train arrives in the Brooklyn Army Terminal at 1st Street and 58th Avenue at 9am, and Elvis steps off the train and is met by Colonel Parker and hundreds of reporters and photographers. Among them is Alfred Withmeyer, the famous photographer who met at first photographed Elvis in 1956 in New York. Alfred recalls, on September 22, 1958, Elvis and 6,000 other soldiers and dependent Americans and civilians left Brooklyn port of embarkation on a troop ship. A press conference was held supervised by a general in civilian clothes who would never leave Elvis aside because he was basking in the publicity. Colonel Parker is also there. Elvis now has a crew cut and his sideburns have been shaved off. I was standing to the right where there aren't too many photographers because all you would get is Elvis's ear and profile, like so. But I was in the perfect spot to catch those unguarded moments when he looked away. I was on the same side as Colonel Parker. He turned to me and said, With Meyer, taking good photos, I hope. And I said, Always, Colonel, always. Once Elvis finished with the press, it was time to load up his duffel bag and join the rest of the guys on board the USS Randall. All of the soldiers and dependents, family of those that were stationed in Germany, boarded during the press conference. Elvis and several others in Class A started walking up the gangplank onto the ship. When photographers asked for another shot, the boys had to turn around across the gangplank again, which wasn't easy with those heavy bags. Ultimately, when the ship is ready to pull out of the harbour and being pushed by the tugboats, Elvis opened up a box the Colonel had given him. You could see him holding the box right there. The box included a lot of two by three photos of Elvis with a facsimile signature, which Elvis tossed off the side of the boat onto the pier. And they came fluttering down to the strains of his own music. Girls were bursting into tears as photo cards fluttered down from the upper deck. The scene wasn't over yet. The Colonel had it all figured out. Having the army play hound dog, 
don't be cruel and tutti fruity instead of the usual military marches. Apparently, the colonel had the sheet music handed out to all the musicians in advance. The army got its publicity and so did the colonel. That's the first time in history of the American army that a troop ship left the port where they didn't play John Philip Sousa marches. They played the songs of an entertainer instead. But they still said Elvis would be treated no differently than any other soldier. When it came time for the ship to leave, the whole world was there to see him off. Elvis stood there waving with Charlie by his side. A tugboat pushed the ship out to the Atlantic and kept shooting permanently, recording my last images of Elvis. And as you can see there, a newspaper report that actually says Private Presley Sales. So he did actually get worldwide attention when he actually left on the ship. Charlie recalls, Elvis came through the ship looking for me after we sailed out of the harbour. Charlie, he said, I don't know a single one of these guys up here in my compartment. You want to move here with me? Elvis got the permission from the ship's officer and Charlie Hodge moved in with his friend. During the days on the high seas, Elvis was smiling and relaxed and easy going, but at night he grieved in his bunk. Charlie Hodge said, I would lie there in the darkness and listen as he quietly moaned from down deep in his heart. After a while, I would climb down and sit on the side of his bunk. I'd tell him jokes and stories until he began to feel a little better and could fall asleep. And when I climbed back up to my bunk, I made it my goal to keep Elvis laughing all the way across the ocean. For eight days, the USS Randall was the only home to these thousands of American soldiers. The ship's officers kept the soldiers busy, sweeping off the decks, scraping all the rusty spots off the iron, etc. They asked Elvis and Charlie to put together some entertainment for the troops during the voyage. A sailor named Ski oversaw the production. They spent a lot of time in Ski's compartment. Ski had an accordion laying around that he played when he got lonesome. One day Elvis picked it up and began playing it as well. Elvis and his two assistants put up notes on all the bulletin boards asking anybody with any sort of talent to jump in and be part of the show. Elvis agreed to play the piano but not sing, a deal that Colonel Parker made with the army. September 28, 1958, a Sunday, the variety show in the USS Randall's day room begins. Charlie Hodge acted as MC for the impromptu show. Elvis was not introduced to the audience and he didn't sing a note. He only played piano but he was still the star attraction of the USS Ramblers. The arrival of the ship in Germany carrying Elvis was however an event that generated great excitement even amongst those in the crowd who were not really Elvis fans, but had come along to simply see what all the fuss was about. News your cameraman and a battery of press photographers, some hoisted high above the gangplank on the cranes, encouraged the more adventurous youngsters to death-defying feats. Helg Rothenberg, as you can see in this picture, climbed up onto the gangplank to be photographed, asking Elvis for an autograph. Awkwardly, Elvis tried to scroll his signature with his free hand and failed miserably, almost losing his balance before shaking his head and hurrying down to the quay. A troop train was backed up all the way to the ship's disembarkment area and Elvis along with the other bemused GIs made his way across the cleared guarded area of passage. Suddenly the barriers broke. The fan set off and ran for the train that Elvis was to climb on. The military police 
were helpless. At his train window, Elvis picked a bunch of carnations to pieces. There was a brawl for each of the blossoms that fell from his hands. Ray Barracks considered, consisted of little more than long rows of black brick buildings that had once housed Hitler's SS troops and now was the unwelcoming home of the 3rd Armoured Division. It was secured behind fences and well-guarded gates. The troop train arrived in Friedberg at 7.30pm, but the waiting fans were bitterly disappointed. The eagerly waited arrival of Elvis in Friedberg was disappointing for his fans. Hosts, hosts of youths had gathered at the train station in Friedberg to welcome the train, with Elvis and hundreds of his comrades. But the train didn't stop at the station. Instead, the train brought Elvis and the other soldiers directly to the base, one and a quarter miles away, where Elvis and the others got off at a loading bay that was for tanks. Elvis was escorted by two military policemen into the Ray Barracks. After drawing his field gear, including a steel helmet, water bottle and size 11D boots, handed to, out to him from Sergeant William Patson, while all the time encircled by a multitude of press reporters and photographers, Elvis was marched to bed 13 in barrack 3707 ground floor, where a large sack of fan mail was already waiting for him. On Thursday morning, October 2, at 10 o'clock, the ordinary soldier attended a monster press conference in the enlisted men's canteen, containing of dozens of journalists kitted out with their own kind of battle gear, tape recorders, sound recorders and notebooks. A reporter noted the conference was a shade smaller than President Eisenhower may have expected. For the benefit of the press, Ray Barracks had been prepared by cleaning squads and painters who had, among other things, painted the window frames. When Elvis, prior to taking on the press corpse, leaned against one of the window frames, the sleeve of his new dress uniform was coated with wet paint, as you can see there on the elbow of Elvis's jacket. Someone immediately rushed off to find a bottle of paint remover to clean up the jacket and the paint stains were successfully removed. The pungent odour from the alcohol in the paint remover, however, lingered on. Refusing to walk into the conference smelling like he just had drunk a bottle of cheap whiskey, Elvis promptly issued, was promptly issued with another uniform jacket. Ten pounds lighter than he had been before basic training, Elvis looked stunningly handsome. Oddly distracted and often bemused behind the microphones, but he answered the questions with grace and sly humour. Asked if he'd had any trouble or ribbing from his fellow soldiers, Elvis insisted he had not. That he had been treated just like any other soldier. They soon find out I'm just like they are, he said. Asked if he would be joining his fellow soldiers in friendly dice games, Elvis craftily said, No sir, I don't gamble. I have to be very careful what I do or say. Most people who like me are very young and I don't want to do anything to lose their respect because if you do, you are finished. After the press conference, Elvis mingled with the attending press representatives and other media until he received mail delivered from the lucky postman F. Kosler. Elvis's mail read, his family will soon arrive in Friedberg. A lucky moment for Elvis. At the same press conference, the army pronounced that Elvis would be assigned to Company D of the 1st Medium Tank Battalion. 32nd Armour, 3rd Armour Division of the 7th Army. He reports to Sergeant Hackney 
of the D Company and the regular army tried to find a place for their celebrity to serve like any other soldier. The conference was followed by a three-day period when the press and other media were allowed to roam freely over the post to get anything they wanted by way of photographs and interviews. Elvis was often pictured with, on and in tanks. It was during this three-day period for the press it was announced that Elvis would be assigned to headquarters company as Jeep driver in a reconnaissance platoon and not as a tank driver as previously stated. This, the army insisted, was a case of being awarded more responsibility, not less. It was a job given only to soldiers of above normal capability, which in this instance included the ability to work on Elvis's own map, read and draw sketches. Knowing tactics and recognise the enemy and enemy weapons. Having proven that they were not awarding Elvis any special privileges, the army on October 5 closed the base to the press and other media. Elvis's father Vernon, Grandma Minnie Mae and friend Lamar Fike arrived on October 4, 1958 from the States. Red West, just out of the US Marines, also enjoyed also joined the group. From the 4th to the 6th of October 1958, Elvis quartered his entourage at the Ritter's Park Hotel in Bad Homburg. Grandmother Minnie Mae, Father Vernon and Elvis's friends were guests of the hotel. When Elvis arrived in Bad Norheim in 1958 to begin his military service, there were no traffic signs throughout the town. The heart and the rheumatism baths back then were still there from the great times before the worst First World War. When crowned heads and sheiks walked through the spa gardens. Since the middle of the 19th century, rich Americans also came to drink cures and find bathing treatments. After the war, Bad Norheim glad gradually became a social bath. After 1945, German-American encounters were limited to official events. The soldiers preferred to drink Jim Beam at the Capri Club at the Ray Barracks instead of the reddish-brown spring water in their own bars until GI number 53310761 started his service. It was Elvis' first week in Germany when he visited the barber shop at Ray Barracks and let the German hairdresser Karl Heinz Stein cut his hair. Karl, who cut Elvis' hair three times a month, said, his memory was of a well-raised, polite young man who asked for no special treatment except to be allowed to drive home from the barracks at odd hours to avoid the crush of his fans and to eat the food prepared for him by his grandmother, Minnie Mae. The haircut cost 35 cents, and Elvis always gave Mr. Stein a 65-cent tip. Elvis drove every day from Bad Homburg to the Ray Barracks in Friedberg, where his service began very early. Therefore, he decided to look for a new hotel in Bad Norheim, which was only three miles away from the Ray Barracks in Friedberg, and he could sleep a little bit longer. On October 7, 1958, the same day as he got his hair cut, he moved everybody from Bad Norheim into Hill Hilbert's Park Hotel in Bad Norheim, a well, an old, beautiful cobblestone building. He chose the well-known Hilbert Park Hotel, at that time a traditional luxury hotel in which celebrities descended. It no longer exists today. The whole group moves into rooms 311, 316, 318 and 319. A few days later, Elwes receives permission to move his army gear out of Ray Barracks and live off post until the military under the Military Sponsoring Act with dependents and friends. Almost immediately, Elvis joined them in the Hilbert Park Hotel, but the Presley clan, clan would only stay there a brief period. They had to leave the hotel because of his friends, Red West and Lamar Fike, who were being too noisy. 
After only five days in the Park Hotel, Elvis moves with his friends and family to the Hotel Grunwald. They lived in the converted attic story floor. Elvis's room number was 10. Room 11 was for his fan post, in which later lived his secretary, Elizabeth Stefanik. Lamar Fike was in room 12. Red West was in room 14. Grandma Minnie Mae was in 15. And Father Vernon was in 17. Shortly after Elvis moved in, the ever-vigilant German press were reporting that he did not wear pyjamas, but slept in his underwear, and that a Bible always laid on his nightstand. Because the hotel generally served only breakfast, Elvis and his entourage, however, came to an agreement whereby, for an extra charge, they could have other meals made to order and served in their rooms. Red West and Lamar Fike would take care of Elvis's chores, including shining his shoes and army boots. But when they find themselves with time on their hands, they would retire to Beck's Bar, located conveniently around the corner in the hotel, where Red frequently became involved in fistfights. Manfred Pohl, a German military policeman, then attached to the US Army, and working for the US Army Public Affairs in Gleason, remembers arresting Red West after a brawl with two policemen near Kahos in Bad Norheim. Red was held for a few hours to cool off before being released. Red encountered the law a second time after a barroom quarrel with some locals. He had been drinking and was playing the dollar game with the Germans. He would hold out a dollar bill and demonstrate how a burning cigarette end would not scorch its way through the banknote and dare anyone to lay the bill on the back of their hand while he pressed the lighted cigarette onto it. If they could stand the heat and hold still until the note started to burn, they kept the dollar. If not, Red won himself a drink. Red always won. And it was a painful experience for the loser. One such contest led to Red's arrest. Vernon Presley was also seen drinking heavily in the bars of Bad Norheim and often invited everyone in the bar to join him, a form of drunken generosity that angered Elvis, as Vernon rarely carried enough cash to pay for it. On October 30, Elvis bought a seven-and-a-half-week-old male poodle puppy he named Cherry from breeder Adolf Och in Freckneham, northeast of Frankfurt, just before going on manoeuvres. Red West and Lamar Fike burnt off their excess energy by indulging their spirits in boisterous wrestling matches, pillow fights and water pistol duels, which quite often spilled out into the hallways. When Elvis wasn't at the base during his duties as a soldier, he also participated in these games. The hotel's elderly guests did not appreciate these performances and lost no time in making their feelings known to the owner, Mr. Schmidt. In return, complained to Elvis about the behaviour of the American guests. Then, to make matters worse, Elvis bought this little puppy which he then couldn't look after because he was working all day at the base and had to go on manoeuvres. Mr. Schmidt complained that the girl in the kitchen, or sometimes he personally, looked after that dog while Elvis was away at work. He looked after the dog more than Elvis's family or friends ever did. After a goodbye party at the Hotel Greenworld, on November 2, he went the next day for seven weeks to manoeuvres, the first field training for Elvis on German soil. On November 3, 1958, during his second month in Germany, Elvis joined the 32nd Tank Battalion in Friedberg a part, as a part of Combat Command C of the Army 3rd Division. As special training manoeuvres in the area of Grafenwacher 
a bullishly cold snow covered area of wooden hills 110 miles from the border of the communist Czechoslovakia the third armored division's primary mission during the cold war was defense of the Fulda Gap a possible route for the hypothetical Soviet tank attack upon West Germany the troops frequently conducted field training exercises using live fire stealth movement and communication tactics Elvis was a part of this defense team just like any other soldier neither the training exercises nor the winters were pleasant and Elvis's first experience on field maneuvers left him longing for the US and his beloved Graceland his personal letters reflect his gloom as evident in a part of this letter that was sent in November 1958 to Alan Fordus he said I am pretty lonely or I wouldn't be writing you a letter we are up at a training area for 50 days and believe me it's miserable it's cold here and there's nothing at all to do I'm about 200 miles from Friedberg I won't be back until the the 20th of December it will sure be a great Christmas this year ha huh. I wouldn't I would give almost anything to be home I can hardly wait to start singing traveling making movies and above all seeing the old gang again and seeing my beloved Graceland all I do is sit and count the days despite the fact that Elvis was a darn good soldier he hated field training he did his job very well when he was in the field but made no bones about his feelings boy I hate this heartbreak hotel who's heard to say during maneuvers in November and December of 1958 there is even a written source documenting Elvis's feelings towards training as quoted in a letter dated November 11 1958 to Sergeant Norwood and his family he said we well, are up here at this place called Gruffenwall I'm sure you've heard of it it's miserable up here and we are here for six weeks the German people are very nice and friendly but there is no place like the good old USA I am with a bunch of boys and a sergeant and although I would have given anything to stay at Fort Hood I would have done so gladly I would love to have been there with you guys the amount of caffeine in coffee was apparently not potent enough to cope with the hardships a sergeant gave Elvis and some other GIs pills to keep them energized their maneuvers in the cold of winter took their toll on Elvis there was also the obnoxious comrades asking him for autographs or wanting to be photographed with him many of his superiors also took pleasure in being seen and photographed with their star soldier so there we have it we have Elvis well and truly in the thick of his stent in the army he's doing it tough it's cold he's not happy he's doing things that he would never have done before he wants to get back he wants to go do movies again he wants to sing he wants to entertain he wants to be with family and he wants to be home at Graceland so let me know guys what you think do you think it was tough for Elvis do you think he you know he liked being in Germany but just didn't want to be a soldier or do you think he took it on the chin and said I'm doing it don't forget to like don't forget to subscribe write your comments down the bottom and we'll see you all again next week take care guys see you next week bye